Andrew, we're at the conference, the quest for consonants, uh, theology and the natural sciences, and one of the areas that are, is being discussed here is something that has uh, consumed me for decades, and that is uh, looking at the cosmological structure of the universe and asking what can we infer about the deep ontology, the deep reality of, of the universe. And I don't think that you can discern exactly a god but, uh, or not, uh, but uh, at least being able to explore that in, in great depth. You're, you're bo both a particle physicist, a philosopher, a theologian, a priest, um, and so I'd like to focus on particle physics, which is your expertise, which is not something I have followed as much as the big cosmological structure. Mm. Now, at the very beginning, the two, particle physics and cosmology, are very much the same. Uh, so from the standpoint of a particle physicist and as a believer, uh, wh what, what can you tell me about the structure of reality? Gosh. <laughs> so um, well, a good way of starting uh, an explanation um, is, uh, particularly in regard to the science and theology issue, is uh, what happens when I go into schools and I give uh, talks often to school children. And they ask me, how can I be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. And I say, we invented it. <laughs> and I showed them a picture of Monsignor Georges Lemaitre, who was the priest who solved Einstein's equations right. of general relativity to predict universal expansion. Mm -hmm. And um, the theory was banned in the Soviet Union. People don't know that. In 1948, yeah, right. the astronomers in the Soviet Union were told, we must oppose the Big Bang Theory, it's encouraging clericalism. <laughs> so this is part of history we don't tend to, to hear very much about. Um, what, is this, what does the Big Bang tell us about the structure of reality? Um, basically, that there's a kind of fruitful simplicity at the start of everything. Um, the universe begins simple, but with a, an extraordinary potential. Uh, and then gradually, it's like a flower blooming. Um, it's not like an explosion, which is a chaotic thing. It's almost like a flower blooming. And gradually, uh, the different um, light uh, is uh, transmuted or becomes particles, and then particles combine and create atoms, and then you get atoms cooking in stars to create um, the various uh, different, uh, different elements and so on. And there's a kind of wonderful story about all this, a wonderful narrative, that out of this um, initial simplicity, but with a rich potential, comes this extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily complex and beautiful universe. And from the standpoint of particle physics, as opposed to the theories of cosmology, mm -hmm. cosmic inflation, nucleosynthesis, but what, what is the contribution of right. particle physics right. uh, to, to understanding that? Well, uh, with regard to particle physics specifically, um, we are able to create time machines. So uh, in our big colliders at CERN and also mm. here in the United States, we are able to we smash particles in very high energy densities. We recreate the conditions of the Big Bang. And um, what happens is that some of the, uh, the forces which look very different in everyday life are suddenly seen to be much more closely related in, the, in that primeval state. Um, than, they are, than they are in, the, in everyday uh, terms today. So we can see the underlying, that, that we can recover some of the underlying simplicity, that rich simplicity of the beginning of the cosmos. So, so, so describe that in detail because there are four forces and they look like they're very, very different. The gravity certainly looks wildly different from electromagnetism. The, the order of magnitude, they differ by what, to, mm. to the 39th or yes. 40th, or so, huge differences uh, yeah. between them and then the the nuclear forces, which only work in very small distances. So these things are very disparate things. Right. But as you increase the energy levels by smashing them more yes. and more, you can then develop theories that unify them. Yes, I actually worked on an experiment for unifying two of those um, forces. Which? The weak and, electro and electromagnetic. Okay. So we're working at the peak uh, energy for, um, uh, for the weak nu uh, nuclear force. And we were able there to uh, see and test the underlying symmetries. Um, so uh, we, we're part of the way uh, in this, uh, along this path of... And of, the progress that you've yeah. made in unifying yes. the, the two forces, uh, electric, mag, uh, electricity and magnetism, and, they, the, and then they came together with, uh, with the strong force and then the weak force, and so you're, you're unifying them. Gravity is still the mystery, of course, yes. the, it's outside, but you see a path forward that maybe you can get to energy levels where these were all one. Now, to the degree that's true, how does that inform your theological understanding? 
Um, I think with, with in regard to these discoveries of unification and theology, um, I'd be wary about drawing simple conclusions. I don't think there are direct theological implications. But there's a narrative here which ties in very well with the grand theological narrative we've been using for nearly 2,000 years, uh, that, there is a, that the universe has order and um, is the work of a loving creator. And therefore, um, uh, we expect to find order, which we do find, albeit at a level our minds find difficult to grasp. Um, and we find that the many different phenomena uh, which seem unconnected in everyday life have an underlying unity. So I think there is uh, so it's like a kind of consonance of the narrative. Uh, I wouldn't like, wouldn't like to go further than that.